Imagine a new weapon, faster than anything before it, seemingly, well, immune to our best defenses. But here's the real kicker. It's packed, absolutely packed, with technology from nations that officially stand against its very creation. How is that even possible, and uh, what does it mean for the future of global conflict? We're doing a deep dive today into a, well, really sobering new report. It reveals a terrifying truth about Russia's latest drone terror, this jet-powered beast that's, frankly, changing the game on the battlefield. Yeah. With the secrets buried inside it. They're arguably even more explosive than its payload. This could reshape military strategies everywhere. Welcome to Jane Jay's Military Report. Join James and Jane as we analyze the latest in military strategy, global defense, and advanced weaponry. From fighter jets to power shifts, we break down the stories shaping the future of warfare. Today, we're dissecting Ukraine's explosive new intelligence report on Russia's Jaren 3 attack drone. And look, this isn't just about a faster, more destructive weapon. It's really about the shocking revelations of where it comes from, its incredible resilience to electronic warfare, and uh, the truly terrifying implications for modern defense. Prepare to have your understanding of drone warfare completely reshaped. Okay, let's unpack this. We've got some crucial details here. Ukraine's military intelligence agency, the HUR, that's the main directorate of intelligence, they released critical new findings about this Jaren 3. And this isn't, you know, just another small upgrade. It's a significant evolution of a weapon system we first saw in Ukraine earlier this year. And it's quickly become, well, a very common feature in Russian attacks. Yeah, what's truly fascinating here is how the Jaren 3 represents such a substantial leap from its predecessor, the uh, propeller-driven Jaren 2. Now, remember, the Jaren 2 was Russia's version of the Iranian Shahid 136, but the Jaren 3, it models itself after the Iranian Shahid 238. So this isn't just tweaking things. It's a fundamental reimagining of a deadly platform, moving from that slower piston engine design to something much, much more dynamic. It signals a very deliberate strategic move. And here's where it gets really intense. Unlike the, well, the lumbering Jaren 2, this new variant, it boasts a turbojet engine. That's a total game changer. It pushes its speed way up 370 kilometers per hour. That's about, what, 230 miles per hour. Just think about the challenge that presents for air defense systems. Systems designed for slower propeller targets. It's like trying to hit a speeding bullet with a, I don't know, a slingshot. A really intimidating jump in capability. Indeed. And this speed increase, it dramatically impacts its effectiveness and survivability. The HUR report actually specifies that the Jaron 3 usually hits maximum speed when it enters areas covered by Ukrainian air defenses, and crucially, during its terminal dive phase towards the target. So it's not just faster, it's tactically smarter, using that speed burst at the most vital moments to overwhelm defenses and guarantee impact. This acceleration is specifically designed to bypass interception right when it counts. And the range. Get this. A staggering 1,000 kilometers. That's about 620 miles. Enough to strike really deep behind enemy lines. It's packed with explosives, obviously, and detonates on impact after that final high-speed dive. It makes it just a devastating one-way attack drone, designed for maximum traction from a long way off. A widespread and potent threat. Truly a terror weapon. But... What if I told you that this terrifyingly fast drone also possesses a kind of near magical ability to bypass one of our most crucial defense strategies? This next detail, it's truly mind boggling. Military analysts are understandably alarmed. It really is. It's a detail that challenges a core assumption in modern drone defense. The HUR's findings point to a level of electronic warfare resistance we just haven't seen in this kind of weapon before. This isn't just adaptation. It forces a complete rethink of how frontline units protect themselves. Exactly. The HUR claims the Jaren 3 appears immune to electronic warfare. Immune. Now, for those of you tracking military tech, you know that EW, electronic warfare, it's a primary defense against drones. It's used extensively, sophisticatedly on both sides of this conflict. This isn't just inconvenient, it's a massive shift. It's like trying to fight a ghost in the machine and suddenly your best sensors can't even see it. And what this signifies, you know, looking at the bigger picture, is a stark indicator of rapidly evolving countermeasures. The Jaren 3 is apparently outfitted with a satellite navigation system that seems remarkably resistant to the standard EW tactics used to jam or devote drones. This is a critical development. It could effectively neutralize a major defensive advantage, pushing this whole aerial arms race into a new domain. If jamming doesn't work anymore, then physical interception, which is significantly higher cost, higher risk. Well, that might become the main defense, maybe the only defense. It just fundamentally alters the tactical landscape. So what does this all mean for air defense strategies when a common, relatively cost-effective tactic like jamming is just rendered ineffective against such a potent threat? It forces a reevaluation of everything, really. 
What do you think? Mm-hmm. What's the most effective way to counter a jamming resistant drone? More kinetic interceptors, something else entirely. Let us know in the comments. And while its internal layout, a lot of the electronic units share similarities with the Jiren 2, same cameras, same video transmission system. Apparently, the key difference, undeniably, is that jamming resistant navigation. This isn't just a small improvement. It makes the Jiren 3 a far harder target to blind or divert. It lets it stay on course, strike its target with much greater reliability, even when there's heavy EW around. That significantly raises the bar for defensive systems. Now, prepare for probably the most astonishing revelation from this whole report. Despite these sweeping international sanctions, our deep dive into the Jiren 3's insides, it reveals a truth that will, frankly, shock you. The very parts making this drone so deadly, they come from some truly unexpected places. Get this. Ukraine's HUR says nearly 50 foreign components are inside the Jiren 3. And these aren't just from anywhere. They originate from a handful of Western countries. The US, UK, Switzerland, Germany are mentioned, plus China. So this is a weapon used by Russia, but it's built with tech from countries that have imposed heavy sanctions on Russia. It truly beggars belief how these components are getting through. It just sparks so many questions about global supply chain integrity. And it immediately raises that crucial question. How do these foreign-made parts end up in Russian weapons, Mm -hmm. especially with these heavy sanctions in place since the full-scale invasion? It's a profoundly complex issue. We're not necessarily talking about, you know, specialized military parts being directly shipped. Often, these are dual-use technologies, parts with broad commercial uses, microchips, sensors, navigation modules, things used in everything from phones to cars Mm -hmm. and weapons. Right. And the source material clarifies that while countries or companies might not be directly exporting to Russia, these parts can still find their way there. Through various routes, often beyond the original manufacturer's control, it just highlights the immense challenge of actually controlling global supply chains, even with strict sanctions. It's a testament to the, well, the ingenuity, maybe the ruthlessness of procurement networks that can bypass restrictions, a constant game of cat and mouse. And if we connect this to the bigger picture, It really underscores the inherent difficulty in making sanctions truly watertight against a determined adversary. These dual-use components are often readily available on the open market. It makes tracing their final destination incredibly hard once they enter that global supply chain maze. The Jan-3 is just one example. Ukraine has found these foreign parts in many Russian weapons systems. So this isn't isolated. It points to a systemic challenge in controlling technology flow in our interconnected world. And the sheer scale of what Russia seems to be planning with these drones, it's almost unimaginable. We're talking numbers that could just overwhelm any defense system. Are we actually witnessing the dawn of a new horrifying era of warfare where quantity maybe triumphs over traditional quality? It certainly looks that way. The development of the jet power Jiren 3 isn't happening in a vacuum. Mm. It underscores Russia's rapidly growing, truly staggering investment in these one-way attack drone capabilities. They're not just making a few prototypes. Moscow is seriously ramping up production of its Shahed-style drones. We're talking potentially thousands of these weapons modeled on the Iranian ones each month. This is a major industrial effort. It's aimed at sustaining high-intensity attacks, showing a real strategic commitment to drone warfare as a core part of their offense. This feels like a long-term shift. And they're not just building drones, they're building huge new launch sites, demonstrating the capability to launch hundreds in mass attacks. One bombardment earlier this month apparently involved more than 800 drones. Just think about that number. And Western intelligence suggests this figure could eventually reach a terrifying 2,000 in a single night. Can you even imagine a sky filled with thousands of these deadly machines all heading towards targets? It paints a truly chilling picture of future conflicts a scale that would strain even the best air defenses to their absolute limit. And this massive scale immediately brings up the question, what's the counter strategy? How do you deal with that kind of persistent threat? Ukraine has responded uh, by rushing to mass produce its own large arsenal of interceptor drones. These systems are emerging as a relatively speaking low cost air defense solution. It offers a more economically viable way to fight a swarm of cheap attack drones, especially before using you know expensive traditional air defense missiles for every single one. It's a classic arms race, but with this new twist drone versus drone. The good news, and there is some good news here, is that these Ukrainian interceptors can reportedly now chase down and intercept the Jiren 3. That is a crucial, really high stakes development in this aerial arms race. It shows defensive innovation is keeping pace, well, for now at least, but it's clearly a very tight race. So what do you think is the ultimate solution here? Better interception tech or more effective prevention, stopping them from being built in the first place? Share your thoughts with us. 
So what does this all really mean for the future of warfare, for global security? The whole Jiren 3 saga, it highlights not just a new technological threat, but these complex multi-layered challenges, regulating global supply chains, this relentless accelerating race between offense and defense. It's a powerful reminder that even the most advanced weapons can depend on a highly globalized, often quite permeable economy. Yeah, it really leaves us pondering a profound question. In our incredibly interconnected world, can any nation truly isolate its adversaries from critical technology indefinitely? And maybe more urgently, how quickly can defense evolve when the attack platforms are becoming so sophisticated, so accessible, and frankly produced on such a terrifying scale? The answer is, well, they'll undoubtedly shape the battlefields of tomorrow. It's a dynamic we'll definitely continue to watch with intense scrutiny. You've been listening to J&J's Military Report, where we analyze the latest in military strategy, global defense, and advanced weaponry. We'll catch you next time.